sailing ships of the European explorers took eight months to reach Australia. It was their equivalent of a trip to the moon or beyond. Forthwith, take such measures as may be necessary for providing a proper number of vessels for the conveyance of 750 convicts to Botany Bay, together with such provisions and implements for agriculture as may be necessary for their use after their arrival. Port Jackson, I believe to be, without exception, the finest and most extensive harbour in the universe. It is divided into a great number of coves. That on which the town is to be built is called Sydney Cove. In the whole world, there is not a worse country. All that is contiguous to us is so very barren and forbidding that it may with truth be said that here nature is reversed. And if not so, she is nearly worn out. The minister should surely not think of sending any more people here. My grandfather, Bill Robertson, had left Australia in 1939 at the outbreak of war. Now, in a curious reversal of usual roles, I was returning to find my roots. His passport showed that he had been born in Sydney in 1920. So, here I was. The harbour city, as they call it. Not very original, I suppose, but certainly accurate. Forever. It was supposed to have been painted by some distant relative. I never thought much of it. I could see that great aunt Clara wasn't going to say much more. I began to wonder if perhaps our family history went back a long way. Perhaps to the early days of the colony, the days of transportation. And an ancestor auntie would rather had never existed. Was he a convict? Oh, no, dear, of course not. There you go. Good luck. Thank you. of the 80,000 prisoners sent to New South Wales over the 55 years of transportation were guilty of all kinds of minor crimes, often petty theft. The refuse of one nation laid the foundations of another.
The aboriginal inhabitants of Sydney Cove, the Eora, treated the first fleet of 11 ships with disdain. But as the newcomers settled on their land, conflict was inevitable. European diseases against which they had no resistance decimated their numbers. Bravely, they fought against musket and pistol. Of course, the English treated the place as uninhabited. But we've been here for quite a while. About 40,000 years BC. BC? Yeah, before Cook. <laughs> Are there many of these uh, carvings left? Yeah, thousands, if you know where to look for them. It's said the first words spoken in English by an Aboriginal were to Governor Arthur Phillip. They were, go away, advice that was not taken. street name on the back of Aunt Clara's painting led me to the rocks, an old part of Sydney near Circular Quay where the first fleet landed. Tell me if this is number 15. Uh, yes, near enough. Right. Um, I'm exploring my family history, and I think one of my ancestors might have actually lived here. Oh. Yeah. Really? Yeah. That's great. That's fantastic. Uh, uh what is the family name? Uh, the name is Robertson. His name, his name was William Robertson. Robertson, Robertson. Yeah. William Robertson. Marco yeah. and his team of archaeologists had found artefacts dating back to the first years of the colony. Uh, yeah, we've found uh, a tin teapot, some uh, Chinese plates, a lot of oyster shells, <laughs> and uh, a cockatoo skeleton down the well. Anything sound familiar? It was here, in this area, that the convicts spent their first night ashore after their 12,000 mile journey. Apart from the first houses, here was the first hospital in Australia, the first fort, wharves, observatory, cemetery, bakery, flour mill, and even the first street. Clara told me her grandfather, Edward, had lived in the Rocks area, a respectable businessman. She wouldn't face the possibility he was descended from William the Forger. Hey. What is it? Look at that. E. Robertson and Sons. George Street. That building's still there. nothing left here now. <laughs> right. All I know about E. Robertson is that he built the place in the 1880s and it was sold in 1903 and I think that's when he died. He'd certainly be surprised if he could see the rocks now. It's old buildings restored and thousands of tourists visiting. It deteriorated throughout the 19th century and by 1930 was infamous for its taverns, thieves and razor gangs. But plans to demolish the whole area and build glass skyscrapers unexpectedly aroused the anger of Sydney Siders. Wow. 
why do you want to know about your past? Doesn't everyone? Maybe not in Sydney. What do you mean? You should have seen what was over there 120 years ago. The Garden Palace was built for Australia's first international exhibition in 1879. It ran five times over its budget and sustained a huge financial loss, despite attracting over a million visitors. The fire, started by an arsonist, utterly destroyed the building. And this is where it was. The place really was enormous. Its contents included hundreds of paintings destined for the new art gallery. Records of Sydney's past are also said to have been destroyed. Prominent families were not too upset when documents revealing them to be of convict descent went up in flames. The only trace remaining of this vast building are the iron entrance gates. The early settlers were confined to the narrow coastal plain by the Blue Mountains, which begin 60 kilometers inland. A number of expeditions failed to find a way over. Even highly motivated escaping convicts, convinced China was on the other side, were turned back by sheer cliffs and dense bush. Finally, 25 years after the first fleet had landed, the mountains were crossed by the curiously untried method of keeping to the ridges instead of the valleys. Settlers poured along Governor Macquarie's convict-built road to the fertile Western Plains. The struggling colony's days of near starvation were over. So, that road changed everything? Sure. First, it started off a land rush, then in the 1850s, the gold rush. Sydney never looked back. You know, Benjamin Robertson, William's grandson, had a, a mining right to somewhere called the, uh, the Turon River. Didn't know if he found any gold, though. Most of them didn't. They just did a lot of digging, went broke, and then drifted back to Sydney. Maybe Marco was right. But I like to think he went back with a heart full of hope and saddlebags full of gold, all ready to conquer the world. Or at least the clock business. Time was passing. Convict transportation to Sydney ended in 1840, and the last convict ship sailed to Western Australia in 1868. The imposing Sydney Town Hall was completed in 1889 on the site of one of the colony's first graveyards. 
The rhythm of the chain gang was now a thing of the past. And the bells that tolled, tolled for the workers of a bustling city. Miss Robertson? Miss Robertson? Oh, Mr. Stopes. Yes. Hello, how are you? How do you do? I'm fine, thank you. I've done some work for you. It's, it's this way. Oh, wonderful, thank you. No, he certainly didn't make our clock. Everything came from England in those days. But he could have installed it. There's a thought. My ancestors are proving very elusive. <laughs> well, it's not exactly an uncommon name. There was another Robertson around then, too. He's here. There he is. A. Robertson. He was in the stone business. Sydney Sandstone. This is what gives the old colonial buildings of Sydney their character. Sandstone was quarried from the earliest days of the colony. The first governors had grandiose plans for a city of wide boulevards and imposing buildings. Plans never fully realized because of the rapid growth of the city, a labor force more skilled at picking pockets than hauling bricks, and the caution of those controlling the purse strings back in London. Luckily, Governor Macquarie, who arrived in 1810, discovered among his convicts an architect of genius, Francis Greenway. My search for sandstone among the glass buildings of modern Sydney led me to another Robertson. John Robertson was a free settler who arrived in 1816. He became Premier of New South Wales and would certainly have Aunt Clara's approval. No convict links. radical in his youth, John Robertson turned out to be on the side of the Conservatives when the issue of federating the Australian states arose. He saw federation as the first step to Australian severance from the British Empire. By the late 19th century, 
there were six squabbling colonies dotted around a country the size of Europe, each with their own government, currency and rail systems. Somehow, agreement was reached, and on January the 1st, 1901, the first day of the new century, the Commonwealth of Australia was born in the Federation Pavilion in Centennial Park. <laughs> the nice. nation may have been unified, but the city of Sydney was still split in two. <laughs> There'd been plans to bridge the harbour from as early as 1815. The task was not achieved until 1931. was too deep for pilings to be sunk in the conventional way. So the archers had to be built on both sides simultaneously and aimed at one another. Cynics predicted a fiasco, as they only had to be a few inches out and the bridge would be the world's largest white elephant. Why was this built? Defence. Yeah, but defence against who? Oh, originally the Russians during the time of the Crimean War. Well, this was meant to protect you from the Russians, was it? <laughs> hey, hey, you can laugh, but let me tell you something. Since we built this, the Russians haven't even thought of invading us. <laughs> A couple of uh, Japanese subs got passed behind our backs. But apart from that little hiccup, we scared them all off. Your grandfather would have sailed past that side of the island on his way to London. Australia fought not just in the Pacific to save the country from invasion, but sent troops to Europe in both world wars. My grandfather was a fighter pilot, and one of those who never came home.
has always been a place of new beginnings. After the war, hundreds of thousands of migrants arrived from Europe and quickly transformed an Anglo-Saxon enclave into one of the most cosmopolitan countries on Earth. We want hundreds of thousands of men like you, and we want many, many thousands of young women too who will come with you to join uh, their fate and your fate uh, with our destiny. You are very welcome as new Australians in our Australian community. The people of Sydney are often accused of being too obsessed with an outdoor life, but why not? Eighteen-foot skiffs have been sailed on Sydney Harbour for 150 years and have their origin in the race to the cargo ships newly arrived from England. The first merchant to reach them would have his choice of the goods. Despite Australians' reputation for amiability, a debate about the Sydney Opera House managed to evoke passions from every section of the community for over 25 years. Where would it be built? Wouldn't it be too costly? Who would design it? Was it necessary at all? The site chosen, Benelong Point, was named after an Aboriginal befriended by Governor Philip in 1789. He lived in a small house on the point. Later, a fort was built there, and then a tram shed in the style of a fort. In 1956, an international competition was won with a simple sketch by a Danish architect, Jørn Utzen. The design was so radical that engineers spent years working out how to build it. Delays, bungles and an astronomical cost overrun resulted in Utzon's resignation. The arguments continued as the building stumbled towards completion.
From all the controversy emerged one of the indisputably great buildings of the 20th century. You're doing very well for the first time. Thank you. Give me a look at your arm. Okay. All right. Thank you. How more? I... Yeah, more. Surfing in Sydney dates back only until 1902. Before that, swimming in the sea was forbidden by law. <laughs> Australians took to the sport with enthusiasm, but had no idea at first how to deal with the unpredictable surf. It was here at Bondi in 1906 that the first captain of the Surf Bathers Life Saving Club developed the rescue methods that have saved thousands of lives. I hope you've enjoyed your desserts. Delicious, thank you. Fantastic. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Oh, we will. Thank you Thanks, much. Danny. Thanks. Well, we haven't done very well, I'm afraid, tracing your family. Too many Robertsons. <laughs> <laughs> well, I found other things. Besides, you don't have to have blood ties to feel that you belong somewhere. This was my grandfather's home. If it weren't for the war, I would have been an Australian. <laughs> huh. Oh. I found this at the dig. In what probably would have been number 15. <laughs> it's a love token. Traditionally, they were carved by the convicts and given to someone they loved. Such a beautiful 